Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to see your faces this morning. Welcome to our online service for the Unitarian Church of Staten Island. Welcome from the comfort of your homes, from wherever you are and however you're feeling. I hope you find a way to get comfortable where you are in your own body to rest and relax and enter into this time of community and connection. I am the Reverend Emily D. Tarbert, and I'm speaking live from my apartment here in Marble Hill, Manhattan, and I'm grateful to be with all of you this morning. I'd like to begin our service with these words from Carl Sagan. Science is not only compatible with spirituality, it is a profound source of spirituality. When we recognize our place in an amenity of light years, in the passage of ages, when we grasp the intricacy, the beauty, and the subtlety of life, then that soaring feeling, that sense of elation and humility combined is surely spiritual. The notion that science and spirituality are somehow mutually exclusive does a disservice to both. I invite Chris Johnson to light our chalice this morning. Good morning. Please uh, join me in the chalice lighting affirmation as I light the chalice. In the search for truth and the spirit of love, we unite for worship and fellowship. Thank you, Chris. And as we have been doing, I light these candles as an extension of our chalice lighting in honor of the names of those who've been recently affected by police brutality. We know that we cannot cover the names of all of those who've been recently affected. We light a candle for the life of Xavier Hill. for the life of Patrick Warren Sr. And for the life of Carl Dorsey III. May these lights be a symbol of our commitment to continue the work of racial justice and to proclaim that Black Lives Matter. I now invite you to sing with us. One second. To sing with us our hymn that Kevin and Carolyn will sing, Morning Has Come. You'll find the lyrics on your screen. Open our eyes to see the 
Thank you so much, Kevin and Carolyn, for arousing opening hymn this morning. We're so grateful for your music as always. Good morning, everyone. In light of uh, so much conversation, we would like to uh, transition our joys and sorrows to the beginning of the service so we get to really hear your joys and sorrows on your hearts this morning. So I invite you to chat in the chat box to everyone or to share aloud, unmute yourselves as you're able to do and share what's on your heart for our community. Are there any other joys and sorrows to share this morning? Well, I have one. I originally planned this for the meeting, but it makes more sense to do this here. This uh, after service, we'll be having a mid-year meeting where we talk about what we've been up to this year, which has been mostly quarantine and, and virtual church and amazing things we've done. But one of the things we recognize every time we gather are the members who've passed away from our community. So I'd like to light these three candles for the members specifically we know there are families there are friends there are people outside of our circles many people have passed away and we hold them all in our hearts but specifically the members of our community we know who passed away this year i light a candle for levesta thompson jr for richard curry And for Harvey Rosenfitz. Let me find some better candles for you all. But we light these, we light these lights for Harvey Rosenfitz, Levester Thompson, and for Richard Curry. In our mind, we know that their legacy lives on in us. And I'd like to just take a moment of silence to think about those who in our lives have passed away this year and whose legacy lives on with us. We are called to live their legacy of love and their memory is a blessing to all of us. May it be so yes. and amen. While I go find some new candles, I'm going to invite Chris Johnson to read our reading this morning. Good morning, thank you, Emily. Our reading is an excerpt from Carl Sagan's The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. This is uh, from a chapter, this is from the chapter Science and Hope, and it's good to note that this was written in 1995. Science is more than a body of knowledge, it is a way of thinking. I have a foreboding of America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy when nearly all the key manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few and the ones representing the public interest can't even grasp the issues, when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority, when our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide almost without noticing into superstitions and darkness. Whenever our ethnic or national prejudices are aroused in times of scarcity, during challenges to national self-esteem or nerve, when we agonize about our diminished cosmic place and purpose or when fanaticism is bubbling up around us, then habits of thought familiar from ages past 
reach for the controls. We're thankful for our reading today. Thank you for your patience, everyone, while I got ourselves some new candles to light. And thank you for that reading, Chris Johnson. For as long as I've been a public school student, Science and faith seem to have been pitted against each other like some big saga for which one has the truth. I remember this clearly, especially in the ways my high school biology teacher had to very strategically talk about evolution in class so as to not to get in trouble with Ohio's laws about religion, evolution, and creationism. Growing up as a Unitarian Universalist, this debate and even hearing the arguments of my classmates who would talk about God and creationism always frustrated me because that wasn't the faith that I knew. The faith that I knew growing up was the wonder of a microbe and the dance of electrons. This might be in part because my grandfather and father are both chemists and Unitarians. But beyond just my family, this Unitarian Universalist faith is filled filled with scientists. Take, for example, Joseph Priestley. He was the founder of British Unitarianism. He was the Unitarian minister that converted King's Chapel in Boston from Anglican to Unitarian. And he was also a well-known scientist. He discovered oxygen and several gases and would begin the chemical revolution. Or if we want to talk about evolution, Charles Darwin's mother, was Unitarian and he grew up in a Unitarian church. He was originally going to be called to Unitarian ministry until he started his journey of evolution and became agnostic in his life. Faith and science, at least in Unitarian Universalism, has never been a contest, but a glorious and beautiful relationship. And no wonder, there's beauty and wonder in the process of discovery in experimentation and finding new truths. There's wonder when we learn about our universe and our world together in it. Our Unitarian Universalist faith in its search for truth shares a humility with science that we always test and we question and we discover more about our world. There's a shared understanding that we need to time and time again challenge theories and change our ideas along the way. Science, both the scientific method and different discoveries of science, have always had a place in my heart as a part of my faith. This past year, the same heartbreak I experienced and frustration I experienced in high school around conversations about evolution have been brought back when it comes to conversations on our political scale and national scale about COVID-19. I've seen the way religious voices specifically have been manipulated on our political stage to dismiss, ignore, downplay, or circumvent public health information from medical doctors and scientific researchers around COVID-19 this year. Over and over again, we've seen blank or vague statements about why it isn't necessary to wear masks or why certain religions may feel like they shouldn't need to wear masks, why it's an individual right over public safety. I've specifically seen religious voices be manipulated to miscount or question or doubt the number of illnesses, the number of deaths, the side effects of COVID-19. I've seen religion used as a main source of mistrust. And as we read the words of Carl Sagan about fanaticism, the prevalence of fear, they feel so eerily true to this time, to this world, to 2020 that we just left behind. And now after this year, this year of questioning and doubting and, and throwing everything into flux, in this culture, 
And on this stage is where we have a COVID-19 vaccine. I want to be as nuanced as possible in this sermon. So please give me patience. Understand that admittedly this mistrust is not only due to political or religious voices that have been manipulated. Science, like any tool, over time has been used for evil or malicious purposes throughout our American past. Our country's long history of practicing medical malpractice on marginalized communities for scientific or medical research has proven just how untrustworthy sometimes our medical practice in the United States can be. From the origins of gynecology where surgeries performed on black women's bodies without their consent to the Tuskegee experiment where black men were studied but never treated for syphilis. Medicine and pseudoscience have led to many deaths, have led to irreparable harm to communities of color. And it's the same system, the system of, of racism that we see even in the treatment of black and communities of color around COVID-19. So, no wonder there is a mistrust for information regarding coronavirus and the vaccine that could help save countless lives. There are medical and safety reasons why someone would choose not to take a vaccine. I am not a doctor nor a scientist. Please talk to your doctor and medical professional as you discern. We know that the choice to vaccinate is a personal one and people should not be shamed or ridiculed for the personal choices they make regarding vaccines. You never know a person's story, especially given this history we just talked about. But that's why it's so much more important for those who are able and willing to choose to vaccinate to help the immunity of our communities. And it's why I'm so grateful for specifically the people who've been aware of this history and through representation, conversation and others have advocated for the health and safety specifically of African Americans and people of color in regards to coronavirus and this vaccine. Take for example, Dr. Kazumika Corbet. She is the black woman, the black woman who is a viral immunologist at the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institute of Health. She was one of the scientists at the head of clinical trials for the Moderna vaccine. It's been her voice and her advocacy specifically in making sure that the clinical trials involved black, indigenous and people of color in the clinical trials that have helped to advocate for this vaccine in ways that rebuild that kind of trust. We have Sandra Lindsay, who was the first person to ever receive the vaccine in the United States. She's a black woman nurse who worked in Queens in the heart of the epidemic. And here on Staten Island, we have voices who are also trying to outreach to our own community. We have voices like those of Reverend Janet Jones and Bishop Vicar Brown, who are working with Project Hospitality to share their stories and their choices to try and rebuild that kind of trust. I've been uh, invited and given permission to share Reverend Janet Jones' own uh, testimony around her hashtag my COVID vaccine from Project Hospitality, which I'll share with you now. for us to uh, uh, take advantage of all the avenues that we have to get a, a, a handle on this vaccine so that we can achieve the immunity that we need for the benefit of the community, the benefit of our nation and the world. And fear, we should not, we should not let fear stop us from doing that, which can, can bring about what we all want, to be able to uh, uh, get over the sequestering, to be able to re return to moving about freely, being able to fellowship, being able to help others freely without fear, 
Um, and I take it because I want people to not be afraid to take it. Um, and I don't like needles. Coming here, I felt dizzy thinking about getting a needle in my arm. <laughs> but it's important that I do this, not just for me, but for others. Um, so I'm grateful that I have access to, to this vaccine for us to uh, uh, take advantage of all the avenues that we have. Okay. I just wanted to take a moment to share someone else's voice that isn't mine, especially given the history we've just talked about when it comes to the mistrust that's been built between communities of color and medical research. Trust between ethical medical discoveries and the public needs to be reestablished. And that trust isn't helped when political voices subvert faith to ignore or downplay what's happening in regards to a vaccine. It doesn't help when faith is used as the reason why people stick to individual liberty above all else. And that's why as a person whose faith is called to science, I feel so compelled to try and do what I can, acknowledging I'm not a scientist or a doctor, to rebuild some of that trust. I'm grateful for interfaith voices around Staten Island sharing public health measures around mask wearing, around protocols. I'm grateful for the ways faith leaders have spoken about their relationship to medicine and science. Faith and science should be in a world where they work together one lending a moral voice and an ethical clarity, while the other gives humility, focus, and question. Faith should not be the go-to source for suspicion for every medical advancement. Faith should not fear or be fear above all else, individual liberty above all else, above compassion, above human community, above risk or discovery. Faith should celebrate the ways we doubt, we question, we test and the process of new scientific discoveries. And I've laid all this groundwork about faith and science and racism, about this culture that's downplayed medical advice and public health, because the way it's impacting our culture denies us one thing, joy, <laughs> joy and hope. There's radical beauty and hope about this scientific achievement. Just like when you think, when you look at your hand and in awe of the number of cells that are in one fingertip, the number of cells in one fingertip, understand the delicate, powerful feet of your own body when it comes to immunity. Do you know the number of countries that had to come together across the world to research this. Did you, did you know the thousands, literally thousands of people who were willing to willingly risk their lives for clinical trials because they knew a global pandemic was happening to make this happen? The, the genius of Turkish immigrants in Germany or the black women immunologists in the United States, the actual decades, like decades, 15, 20 years of mRNA research that went into this vaccine that just so happened, luckily enough, to be ready to start testing last January so that a vaccine could be developed in a year. The ways a global pandemic has changed the heart of our governments to start actually funding vaccine research when you think about everything that has happened, everything that has happened, and the amazing new understandings we have about our body, it's simply amazing work. The work of a global human community grappling with doubts, testing, fixing, and testing again, the shoulders of so much history and work, the generations, and the delicate, beautiful wonders of our own human body. Most of all, it carries a precious hope, a hope that the end of this pandemic is in sight. I say this to you as for the last few days, because I've possibly been exposed to COVID, I've been isolating here in this very room 
and will be until about Monday when I can get tested. I have been eating, sleeping, drinking, <laughs> working in this exact room for the last three days. And I am hopeful for a day where I don't have to think about if someone coughs in my face, will I have to stay away from my wife for a week? I'm thankful for a future where I can go and visit my nieces and nephews, where I don't have to worry about so many people dying, where we can go enjoy Central Park again, <laughs> see each other in person again, that there is an end to this that there is a time when we will be able to be together. There is hope. Much like Carl Sagan says, science is a candle of hope we carry. It's a way of thinking that allows us to test and question and discover so we don't have to be ruled by fear. Fear doesn't have to be the final voice. Hope can be instead. And here we have a vial of hope. So I would like to end this sermon with you, not with my own words, but with a blessing. It was a blessing written by the Reverend Lee Kinvey, who wrote this for their son, Larkinvey. I'll show you them right now. Larkinvey is a 16-year-old son who is in a pediatric nursing home. And Reverend Lee Kinvey, they wrote this blessing on a part of their son getting this vaccine. So I'll share you their words with you now. Blessed are you, vaccine, your tiny potent liquid that fills us with hope of antigens and immunity, of hugs and kisses, of snuggles and van rides, of concerts and classrooms, of more days together on this beautiful planet. Blessed are your developers, Muslim children of Turkish immigrants to Germany, a group long despised and discriminated against, and blessed are all who nurtured and educated you. Blessed are the decision makers, it's not often we felt society prioritizing our beloveds with intellectual disabilities, but today we do. And today we refuse to put a lid on this joy. Today we celebrate wholeheartedly. And we bow in gratitude to the scientists, the medical professionals, the factory workers, and those who kept the laboratories and factories clean we bow in gratitude to the CVS employees, to those who drove the trucks and built the roads and the freezers and the syringes, to the whole world that conspired to support these 0.3 milliliter vials of survival, moving into these humans we love so dearly. We bow in honor and memory of all those who have suffered and died from this disease. And we recognize our obligation to love one another, to live into hope, and to manifest the care for humanity that this vaccine represents. For all of that, I say blessed be, may it be so, and amen. <clears throat> Now is the time in our order of service where we take an offering. We know it is the gifts of, our, of all of us that help support our ability to gather online. Please give as generously as you can. Our offering will be gratefully received. You should see this, but also you should see the things in the chat. come to sing a song about hope. 
I'm not inspired much right now, but even so, I come out here to sing a song, so here I go. I guess I think that if I tinker long enough, one might appear. And look, it's here. One verse is done. The work's begun. I come to sing a song about hope. In spite of everything ridiculous and sad. Though I'm beyond belief, depressed, confused, and mad. Well, I got dressed. I underestimated how much that would take. I didn't break until right now. I sing of hope and don't know how. So I may be that I sub substitute strength because I'm strong. I'm strong enough. I got through lots of things I didn't think I could. And so did you, I know that's true. And so we sing a song about hope. Though I can't guarantee there's something real behind it, I have to try to show my daughters I can find it. And so today, when life is crazy and impossible to bear, it must be there. Fear never wins. That's what I hope. See, I said hope the work begins. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that beautiful, beautiful song today. And now, before we close our service, I invite you for our closing song. Let's Sing, love knocks and waits for us to hear. It's 1029, sorry, I have the wrong number up. <clears throat> and waits for us to hear, to open Seek and find 
Love knocks and enters at the sound of welcome from within. Love sings and dances all around and feels new life I invite Chris Johnson to extinguish our chalice this morning. Please join as I sing, as I sing, excuse me, as, as I recite the, uh, our affirmation as we extinguish our chalice today. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment for these we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I end our service with a quote from scientist Marie Curie. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. May with science and with faith, with renewed community and the rebuilt trust, may we fear less and hope more. May it be so and amen.